create a system. So for example, inside a car, you have a number of microprocessors that work together. And this is, if you like, um, an, an embedded system or a domain specific system. It is specific to that domain to the car. And, and a typical car today has how many micro, not a typical, a high end car today. Can you tell me how many microprocessors there? Approximately 180. Did you say 180? Uh, so it used to be about, it used to peak at about 100 and it started coming down a little bit. Okay, so it's come down to about 80, 85 processors. Uh, these, are, these are multi processor systems, right? So some of these processors sit on the same, sit on the same chip, and that's where this multi processor SOC comes into play. Right? So we compute, we do multi processor computing. Um, in, in, in this in this environment. Now, finally, the word optimization is to make certain that we use these things efficiently. So why do we how why do we need to use these things efficiently? Because it's very costly. Right? So what are the things that we need to look for? One is we need to make certain that um, we we need to make certain that the size is small because the cost of chips are expensive. To manufacture, we got to make certain. We got to make certain that the power consumption is reduced, correct? And we need to make certain that um, it's fast and and can meet all the deadlines that we need to meet. What are the other other reason? Other important um, constraint that we have. We got to get it out fast. That is why we try to use microprocessors rather than design them by hand right from the beginning. Right. So, and the second thing is we can't continue to optimize and optimize and optimize until it's perfect. Right. So, we got to make certain that, that all of these things are balanced carefully. Right. So that everything works and we works and, and, and things are done fast. So today there are going to be four, four talks. Um, the first talk, uh, so originally Professor Henkel was going to give the first talk. Unfortunately, Professor Henkel is sick and well. So he got one of his postdocs to do a video. So we'll play that second. And first we will have Professor Panda. Professor Panda give a talk, um, and then uh, followed by the video, and Professor Songmia, and then um, I'll finish off the last last. All right. So please welcome Professor Panda. Thank you, Sri. Thank you all for demonstrating for this tutorial. It's nice to see a full house. And of course, it, these things are optimized in ways that maybe we don't understand. So we look at the registration and put exactly that number of chairs so that it looks like it is 100% soon. Very strategy to make sure that Or if it isn't, then there are some empty, there's some empty state around, and we always go around. Uh, this sort of part of the world, it is not so easy. You walk around on the street, we don't find people. But that is the other way it just invites us to. It's great to be here, and uh, thank you, Sri, for the introduction. Um, we talked about uh, application specific optimization, so domain specific. Optimizations. 
These systems, because they are large and complex, we would like to divide them conceptually into some subsystems, modules, and uh, to order in which uh, these presentations will be done. Uh, they are essentially focusing on one or the other of the different subsystems. Uh, so I will start off with uh, one of those uh, subsystems, which is memory, uh, focusing on the main memory, the DRAM. Uh, but uh, there are, but as we go forward, uh, we will focus on other parts of the network. So we will come together into forming and comprehensive system composed of the different subsystems that we will individually look at. So they will be put together uh, in some uh, nice way uh, in the final presentation that she will be giving us. Uh, but uh, along the way, we will be focusing on some of the individual components to see where is the opportunity for uh, an application specific optimization. That is the flow for this. So I will start off with memory, uh, but uh, there are so many other components. Not necessarily, so the division, when I say subsystem, it isn't necessarily physical all the time. Um, nevertheless, memory is a physical part of the Network uh, that is one of the subsequent. That is also a physical component. It is distributed all over. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, when we think of uh, the different components, the on chip network is conceptually certainly one of the subsystems that we thought and, and an optimization that is aware of the traffic and <coughs> um, then the pipeline that is. Again, distributed because we have a multi processing system, a large number of processor cores. Each of them has a pipeline. So, when we, if we say that we optimize the pipeline in some way or make it aware of the applications in some way, uh, then whatever we are talking about is applicable in a distributed way throughout the, uh, the fabric in which. Uh, so, uh, that is the, the flow of this tutorial. We'll start off with. Uh, uh, DRAM and the memory uh, part of it. Um, what I'll uh, talk about, what I'll focus on is thermal issues. Uh, these are very interesting new um, challenges that come up along with uh, evolution of the technology. The packaging technologies uh, are leading us towards uh, denser memories that are obtained through a 3D integration. That's what uh, uh, this focus is. Leads to more compact systems and so on. There are some nice advantages. There are also some very new sort of challenges that come up, the thermal challenge that we have to solve. On that. that is what the focus is of this first part. Um, again, uh, so there are two things. The, uh, these, uh, so these uh, three memory systems, they are going into, uh, while they started off with. Uh, application specific systems like some accelerator um, systems and GAs and so on, they are certainly moving because of some nice properties that they have. They are moving into mainstream systems starting with uh, laptops and uh, well, it started with a high-end system server, but it is certainly moving in that direction. Okay? Eventually, we will get integrated into over-end laptops. So, um, it's just uh, uh, the transition is on its way. Commercially, those systems are beginning. So, uh, it isn't, uh, so the optimization is not merely uh, limited to an application specific environment. They are also applicable uh, to general purpose environment. Uh, we'll introduce the problems that occur uh, themselves in a generic way, but we'll also talk about uh, if you knew. Uh, a lot more about the application, about the domain, about the kind of applications that would be, that would be running on the system, then what else would you do? There is a standard set of things that you need to do anyway. Uh, these are standard trade-offs with power, performance, thermal. Uh, see. Uh, but, uh, the sec but the follow-up question is that uh, no, the theme here is application-specific optimization, and if I um, 
could extract some additional information if I know more about the application. Uh, the question is, can I optimize the system? That is the question that we have. Okay, um, so we'll, the agenda is like this. Uh, we'll uh, just introduce the uh, 3D memory uh, in a rather abstract way. There's a lot of fascinating uh, stuff going on there with respect to the device, with respect to the packaging. Um, so many things happening up there in the semiconductor space. Uh, but uh, this is a bigger system that uh, the focus of this tutorial is on. So uh, the uh, level at which we will be covering it is uh, sort of a system level uh, view. A lot of things are abstracted out, but we'll focus on that part that is interesting. Um, we'll talk about the thermal challenges that uh, arise in a natural way when you do 3D integration and what to do about it at a higher level of abstraction that you're managing the system, um, um, what to do about it. Then um, we follow that up with the neural network workloads. That neural network had to be there. Every presentation these days must have AI, ML, uh, one of the constituents. So every slide must have. Maybe not every slide, but uh, it would be a disaster if we are against a, a talk here. If this is a three hour tutorial and no mention of AI. So AI is here in a contrived way. <laughs> we have put that up there. Um, what is the theme? Uh, how will it fit into the theme? Or what is the excuse for putting AI? Uh, excuse is that uh, uh, this is domain specific, right? So AI is that domain. So if this is a convenient. Uh, If we go back and then say, do mention of AI, it's all. So we will go into, so it's not a superficial treatment. We will look at some of the machine learning neural network algorithms and uh, argue uh, that this would be a way to decompose uh, such systems so that uh, we, over and above whatever we do anyway with respect to optimizing these systems, there is some application specific. Uh, uh, extraction, uh, some properties that we extract, in terms of which uh, hopefully we can do a better job than what we would have done anyway. That uh, should, of course, be uh, the general optimization is anyway being presented. So it isn't uh, what we are talking about is not limited to just neural networks. We will we'll make sure that this stays in a way that uh, we present the general solution first, uh, but then. Uh, from that that particular application uh, point of view, we will see what the connection is. And if I were to substitute that with a different application, where is it that we would intervene? That you are. Um, I will conclude with this uh, simulation infrastructure. We need to talk about uh, such stuff, but as you know, this is engineering, and uh, there is the need to validate uh, whatever mechanisms. Uh, Suggesting. And uh, that validation is not easy. If I'm talking about the terminal and power and such things, there are applications running on the system and its implications with respect to power and temperature and so on, I ought to be able to view and monitor and uh, work on, right? So we observe those and uh, whatever our, our management algorithms are, we ought to be running them, uh, maybe in hardware, maybe in software. And, um, Finally, we act upon that. All of this, uh, how is it uh, happening? Uh, I ought to be able to do it um, without actually fabricating this, without waiting for building that system in a simulation infrastructure. So uh, there is a major need for uh, pretty complex uh, simulation infrastructure that is uh, modeling our processors for us, modeling our memories for us, uh, modeling the uh, scenario of applications that are running on the processor and simultaneously observing what is happening on the memory system if we are talking about temperature, critical temperature being reached in the memory. All of that ought to be visible in the simulation so that can be the effect of that. So uh, what the simulation infrastructure is, I will uh, talk about that. All right. So let's introduce the stacked uh, DRAM in a way that uh, uh, is mostly uh, logical. Uh, we'll uh, focus on only those physical aspects that are actually 
for us. There's a lot more happening in systems like this. But essentially what you have is a stacked set of dice. There is a vertical stacking that happens in the way that we are going here in the picture. Um, each of them, what we have is, so this is like an eight layer, each horizontal layer, you have Eight dies that are stacked, they are connected through uh, what I call through silicon gears. There's a lot more happening uh, in the semiconductor world with respect to um, 3D stacking. Uh, this connection to interconnect through uh, TSV is only one way of doing it. In fact, this is uh, by now an older way of doing it. People are looking at the monolithic integration, uh, which is a lot more sophisticated than what this is. But nonetheless, this is uh, that's still in. Uh, I would say in research. Uh, this is something that is already productized. Uh, what is the difference? These dyes that we have in the picture, uh, they could actually be independently um, fabricated. There's no relationship between how one die came about and the next die uh, came about. They, in theory, they could be fabricated. Uh, and uh, the standards have been established so that uh, we achieve those vertical connections across the dies through what is uh, system. Yeah. But it's convenient. Um, ideally, they could all, uh, you could be actually mixing up dies that are manufactured at uh, different technology nodes and would still be okay as long as you respect the uh, interconnect, the interfaces that are. Um, but that's not the only way to achieve 3D. Uh, Monolithic 3D refers to a more advanced technology in which these are not separate fabrications, these are actually sequential sets of uh, fabrication. Uh, sequential series of fabrication steps in which you um, first create one layer and over that uh, you fabricate the next layer, over that you fabricate the next layer. So the whole thing is fabricated once. Uh, there you are not mixing technology. Uh, I won't talk about that, although that is uh, one of the more modern pieces of information. Film and research. But this, what we are talking about, is there in commercial systems, has been there, uh, I would say, over the last uh, five to ten years. It's been moving from more customized and specific systems uh, towards more and more generic. Where we are. So today, uh, certainly in the FPGA space and in some in the server space and some of the this ML accelerator uh, designs have this. Uh, um, just to define some terminologies, what we have there, I'll try to be sparing in my use of the pointer because that two things produced the other pointer. I don't see the mouse moving as it is. It's all right. Um, Okay. Okay. So, why 3D? Um, of course, the primary reason is that uh, there is a higher bandwidth that the sensors can deliver. Uh, you have a large number of. Uh, Simultaneous connections to which the data can go in and out of the system. So, usually you would have uh, multiple channels, it may be A, 16, or something like that. Um, latency would be lower, it is more compact, certainly more compact than spreading out the eight, eight uh, dies on a PC. Um, cost is higher for now, but actually there's a lot that is going on in that space and uh, we can expect the cost to 
to follow a typical path of thing. It's getting more and more faster every day. Um, one way of organizing these um, uh, 3D memory systems is uh, uh, well, there is the there is the physical organization that is the same thing. There is a above the physical, there would be a logical organization because the memory needs to be divided into channels and ranks and and so on. Uh, what I have shown here in the picture is uh, one way of organizing. So this uh, HMC is actually an older. Uh, it was like the first uh, standard that came about, and uh, these vertical set of uh, ranks here so you can imagine that the, one of these uh, layers here so that is one die that is being divided into a four by four grid of ranks and a vertical set of ranks here forms a channel so this system here uh, has 16 channels looking at it from the top and uh, each of the channels consists of eight ranks in this picture um, the ranks are vertically distributed in what they call fault or we'll use the uh, word channel. Um, this has evolved since then to a slightly different logical organization that I will get to later in the talk, but this is what the, uh, the classical 3D memory architecture is like. Um, this is DRAM uh, that didn't come anywhere here, but uh, the underlying technology uh, within the RAM, uh, this is pretty much a classical uh, DRAM traditional brain memory. Nothing has changed, at least uh, conceptually nothing has changed. The evolution is only with respect to the way we have integrated them into the lab. OK, where do we stand with respect to its adoption um, in the industry? Um, that HMC was uh, sort of the first standardization. It eventually moved into uh, what is called HBM now, high bandwidth uh, memory. That's the standard that has been evolving uh, through uh, multiple generations um, as of now. So HBM2, HBM3 are the standards nowadays uh, that the 3D memories have. It doesn't matter too much. The um, sort of things that we'll be talking about at the system level, you do need to be aware of uh, uh, the logical picture and how it translates with the physical picture. Temperature is very much a physical uh, matter. So what uh, what's there next? What rank is there adjacent? Uh, so these adjacencies uh, do um, uh, determine our uh, power characteristics and uh, thermal. So there is a need to be aware of that. Uh, nevertheless, the mechanisms that we will be talking about um, can be general enough uh, in nature uh, so that if those uh, the, that mapping changes, the logical to physical mapping, if that changes, then appropriately we would adjust the, uh, the strategies in some way. But we'll try to decouple uh, that, uh, de decouple the components that we have of our system level management uh, such that even if that mapping changes, then uh, we would have to adjust some part of our algorithms. But So these are there in uh, so product wise, uh, the uh, DRAM manufacturers do have uh, uh, these um, 3D memory products and uh, uh, it's used in the it is already there in the different systems um, um, from AMD, Xilinx, um, NVIDIA, Intel and, and so on. So, so the spaces we have seen them in FPGAs, we have seen them in uh, AI accelerators, so we have seen them in server sort of systems. Uh, we have also, we are probably beginning to see, certainly beginning to see announcements of its inclusion in the board laptop and desktop sort of systems. That's where we stand today. That integration can happen in many different ways. Um, it could be something like 2.5D, which one can think of as an intermediate uh, solution. Everything is not uh, stacked, neatly stacked in one um, uh, in one structure there, but uh, maybe the CPU is a separate uh, structure. The memory is a separate structure, but still it is the same package and uh, uh, they are, they are uh, otherwise, uh, even though maybe it is separately fabricated, they are on the same, connected on the same package through, uh, through what is called an interposer. 
but it could also be that the CPU is actually stacked with memory. Uh, so the other layers are the DRAM layers. Uh, the CPU itself can have levels of stacking. Uh, you might have um, uh, SRAM and cache that is stacked on top of the processor uh, in the 3D stacking. This AMD uh, Ryzen system actually has a structure like like this, not the DRAMs, but uh, you have the CPU stacked with uh, uh, cache on top. Not exactly this picture, but somewhat logically similar. So when there is a level of the cache that is uh, uh, stacked. Um, there are also Intel systems where uh, uh, actually, uh, which is actually closer to a structure like this, where uh, there are layers of CPU and there are layers of DRAM on so anyway, it is an active uh, um, space uh, with respect to products. Uh, of course, it's a good idea to um, just have some idea of uh, where we stand commercially. Um, we can push forward with respect to uh, research at the system level, but uh, where today things stand, this is approximate steps. What next? The advantages actually are uh, sort of meaningful and obvious, um, but um, the challenges are the ones that are interesting. Advantages are that it leads to greater compactness, it leads to get better um, speed and bandwidth, uh, and so on. All of that is that's a good part of it. But uh, there are some very interesting challenges that we ought to be aware of. Uh, let's say. Um, the load is uniform, so this is just exaggerating the effect here. Uh, the, uh, in a real 3D stack DRAM, the height isn't that big compared to the length and the breadth. The length and the breadth could still be like a square if I would like to, but the height is, uh, is nowhere uh, along the same dimensions as the length and the breadth. It's, it's smaller, but uh, just because it is important for us, so we have exaggerated it a little bit. So you could think of a PCB at the bottom and a heat sink on top, and this is our structure here. Uh, what I'm trying to show here is that uh, there is a gradient of in temperature that forms in a system like that. It's cooler towards the top because uh, of the of the proximity of the heat sink. Um, it is hotter towards the bottom because the power does not get dissipated as well uh, from the lower floor. Um, nothing sacrosanct about the about what is on top, what is on, on the bottom. If you just uh, flip the PCB, which you might in a real system, you have it in the other way. But uh, anyway, point is uh, um, uh, there is a non-uniformity in the heat uh, dissipation. All the less the heat dissipation ability is not the same, and therefore uh, heat tends to accumulate. This is really the, the the physical problem around which we would like to design some system level. So one is uh, let's uh, do some simulations and uh, try to understand what exactly happens here. Uh, let's see that uh, let's understand that these are memories and uh, without any other information, they are all equally active with respect to memory accesses. Memory accesses cause heat dissipation, right? And uh, therefore, uh, uh, there is uh, that heat that is dissipated when you access one of the memory racks. It has to, um, um, so it, it heats the system in some way. We would like that heat to be uh, in the steady state. We would like uh, uh, that heat to be uh, dissipated at the same rate that it is generated so that uh, temperature does not accumulate. Heat it does not accumulate. And if it does accumulate, then we would have to take some corrective action that can be pretty drastic action that should also be part of the system level management which is that we have some sensors in there to monitor the temperature and if we are reaching any critical temperature then we ought to be taking some action some systems are already built into these uh, uh, modern so of course they should be accessible to us so that um, us means so whoever is doing the management, maybe it's an operating system. If it is a, a processor sort of an environment, regular um, uh, processor environment. If it is somewhere else that the, the management is done, is being done, including in hardware, then um, 
that's where that uh, observation is going. But nevertheless, sensors are there in these uh, systems uh, just so that uh, we ought to be able to get them safely in some way. OK, so there is uh, uh, power dissipation because of the accesses. There is also leakage power dissipation in all of these uh, systems so that even if you are not doing anything, even if the system is just turned on, there is a leakage power. That leakage power is a very interesting effect. Uh, um, there is an interplay between temperature and leakage power. There is a circular dependence, right? Uh, leakage power depends on temperature, uh, but temperature is also dependent on the leakage power. So we ought to be careful with respect to the leakage power. Even if you are not accessing these systems, uh, then too power is being dissipated and there is a need to get that. That is actually a power system. OK, so that leads to some important trade-offs uh, between performance on one side and the thermal issues. Uh, whatever you do, uh, you are not allowed to exceed a certain critical temperature that may be defined by the manufacturer. That might be something like 80 degrees or 85 degrees or something like that. Um, not that the DRAM cannot operate beyond those, but um, the, there might be some high level specification that says uh, if you exceed uh, a certain temperature, in, in the case of DRAM, it might be 80 or 85 degrees, then you have to uh, refresh at a higher frequency. Refresh at a higher frequency essentially means that that much time that while you are doing the refreshing, uh, you are losing from the system. The DRAM is not available for normal. So we could uh, uh, pose an overall system design question in the following way that we, we say, you manage the system, you deliver me the best performance that you can, uh, but under a thermal constraint of uh, whatever that is, maybe. 80 degrees, maybe 85 degrees. So that would be a way to formulate a problem, um, a system design problem that involves. It. So certainly you want the system to work in a way that is safe. That must be the case. Um, but within that, we would like to deliver the best performance. Uh, I just have a quick question. Because data are uniformly accessed over the entire memory space. Yeah. But is it due to the leakage that uh, the, uh, the lower part uh, that heat gets more accumulated? As no, uh, the, the power dissipation is, a, is the sum of the dynamic power and the leakage it's power. Uh, but I'm just uh, separating out the two components. The dynamic power is a function of the axis. The leakage power is one that is a temperature dependent. Dynamic, you can say that it isn't uh, necessarily temperature de uh, dependent. For practical purposes, you can say that uh, this is CV square F and C is not changing. Uh, voltage is voltage, frequency is not changing. Uh, so dynamic uh, power is a function primarily of access. And it should be uniform across the space because all the locations are... Yeah, exposed. yeah, the dynamic power is uh, uniform across the space. The leakage power is not uniform. Uh, because of the temperature dependent, the higher layers are cooler than the lower layers. Uh, so I just wanted to make that distinction. So really primarily do the leakage power than the... If it were just... So if you don't do anything to the system, the completely idle system, uh, then you don't get very high temperatures. This happens, the leakage temperature dependence is there. But uh, if these are in the 30 degrees, 45 degrees range, which is the normal thing, it is not a heated system, uh, then dynamic power is zero. Leakage power is there, but uh, it isn't a critical. Isn't critical. It doesn't lead to thermal issues. So indeed, it is the. Uh, so if you are not doing anything, then it, there's not. Uh, uh, there isn't any concern. There is not, no problem to solve. It is the that as the accesses increase, uh, that's when the problem becomes interesting because dynamic power increases, leakage power also increases because temperature increases. Uh, so there is that. Uh, but uh, both of them, if you, and if uh, the dynamic power is too low, then uh, this isn't a critical issue. Formally, it is not. Thank you. Sure. But our interventions would be different. We ought to be aware of that difference because dynamic power, how do you reduce dynamic power in the memory? 
Yeah, so the only thing that is accessing is influencing it is the accesses. So it is a CPU or whatever system is generating those accesses. We have to slow them down. There is a voltage scaling or frequency scaling. Those are the primary uh, knobs that are there in our hands to um, uh, to achieve uh, any changes. Leakage power, how do you reduce leakage? Yeah, so pretty drastic stuff has to be done to save the leakage power. It can be that maybe there is some voltage control that you can do to uh, save leakage, but actually memory is, uh, you don't do too much. Uh, I mean, voltage control is aggressively done in the processor uh, space usually, uh, but uh, DRAM space uh, there isn't that much of uh, voltage control that you do. So uh, considering that voltage is not being controlled, uh, what is being controlled to save leakage? Threshold voltage, if you could control it, I mean, how much uh, control do we have over the threshold voltage? The transistor is already fabricated. Can you We can. The DRAM systems, uh, remember, there is a need to, uh, in the interest of uh, power and uh, cost and such things. Uh, the margin with respect to changing voltages might not actually be too much. You could do it. Uh, frequency is in our hands because uh, you know we are generating those requests from outside the system. Uh, voltage in the DRAM itself uh, could be, but in fact the uh, standard way for saving leakage power, if we think that leakage power is too much in the memory system, the DRAM system, uh, not some object memory which is SRAM and then we would uh, manage that differently. But uh, in fact, uh, you have to do something more drastic like uh, turning power off. And uh, that is okay. So some of the channels that we are talking about, we would have to intervene by turning them off. Turning off the channel means what? The data is lost if you turn off the channel. So some other things have to be done as part of this. We are reaching the critical leakage power, uh, which is that maybe the data needs to be backed up and so on. So it is a pretty significant penalty with respect to the performance. Um, not much you can do about it. We, we better be aware of that and actively intervene if we so one thing is we don't even allow the temperature to reach whatever the critical um, thing is so just so that uh, how do you not allow maybe you monitor the frequency you change the frequency so that is one way of doing it but if indeed you are reaching a uh, critical temperatures then uh, you have to shut down partially shut down some of the channels other channels might still be working so this could be a, a managed well managed system in which once in a while if you are reaching critical temperatures then intervene through copying of the data out into, so let's assume some background memory is there that is not heated uh, and uh, shut down the channel for the duration that the cooling uh, requires. Okay, so what is being shown here in an animation is uh, that you have a system in which uh, the accessor are Access are actually uniform everywhere. There's no uh, disparity with respect to uh, the sort of the rate at which we are accessing each of those ranks. In spite of that, there is this temperature gradient that is uh, setting up here just because uh, all of them are not, uh, uh, they don't have equal access to dissipation. The higher layers become cooler, it's the, the temperature uh, uh, rises in the lower layers. What you are seeing on the right there is um, just. Um, View of the bottom layer. Okay, so I could do this. I could actually back up data into a 2D memory. 2D memory is just my normal data, uh, which uh, uh, there is more of, but it isn't as compact. As. So, but in a bigger system, it could be that I have uh, at a first level, uh, maybe these 3D DRAM structures. As a backup, I might still have a 2D DRAM structure. So I could be doing that. Uh, the, the other observation is that, so I need to turn the channels off, but which ones do I turn off? There are some interesting um, uh, observations there. Um, all of them are, so they are all heated, but not necessarily to the same extent as it uh, happens. The central ones might actually be more heated than the surrounding ones, um, just because the number of neighbors that you have, the heating is there because of our own channel and because of our neighboring channels. So the central ones have more neighbors and therefore there may be a greater effect there. It's a lesser effect. This is the bigger effect. Uh, uh, the vertical gradient is the is a primary effect. Uh, horizontally also there is a gradient, but uh, to a lesser extent. 
So I can decide in some order to turn these channels off. If the temperature continues to be near critical, then I need to be more aggressive with respect to uh, turning more and more channels until the system stabilizes. So um, some uh, that's what this uh, this animation is showing that there is some order in which uh, we are uh, intervening here, um, which is uh, depend. So maybe which may be like first the central ones and then the corner ones and finally the, the ones on the side or some part uh, some such thing. This of course is a function of the that particular grid that we are showing. If it's a four by four grid, then this is what it is. If it is something else, then uh, conceptually it could be the same thing that uh, we probably want to take action on the channels that are the hottest. Right? So that defines the order uh, for us uh, in terms of uh, what we are, uh, what kind of action we are taking. OK, so this is sort of the conceptual picture where we are coming from and where what the challenge is. And an elementary uh, solution is that I am aware of what is happening in each of the channels. The sensors are there, temperature sensors are there. So uh, at intervals, we monitor what is going on. We monitor the temperature. And if, if we are coming anywhere close to the temperature threshold, uh, that is externally defined for us. So it is the a bigger system that tells us uh, how, how far we can push it with respect to temperature. So let's say a threshold is given to us that is 80 degrees or 30 degrees or whatever it is. Uh, then, uh, we can be aware of that, and if we are, and an overall management strategy can be that if we are coming anywhere close to that, then we take action. That action could be, uh, at the very least, uh, this sort of an action where um, we just uh, turn some channels off. Turn some channels off means there is an implication. Uh, you don't just uh, arbitrarily uh, turn it off. You have to prepare for that turn off, and that preparation would involve some data copying, which is an overhead. So that has to be part of our algorithm. I won't be going into the details of what that algorithm is, but that algorithm has to be aware of several things. One is the overhead due to the copying of the data. Data has to be moved before you can uh, shut it off. Um, so then you would, yeah. There is an overhead, indeed, yeah. Um, you're going to be copying over. So the question is, what is uh, what is our choice uh, anyway? Um, by default, here is one thing we can do, which is uh, uh, actually uh, done today, which is you don't even allow uh, that system to come up anywhere, uh, anywhere there. So if it is 80, then I define other thresholds for me, uh, maybe uh, 75 or 70 or something. If I am crossing 70, then I apply a voltage scaling or some such thing. I do a frequency scaling so that uh, uh, the rate is not even allowing me to come anywhere close to the uh, critical temperature. But if I am anywhere close, so there are some nice uh, trade-offs involved here, all of which we will not be going into this tutorial, but that management is a little tricky. On one hand, you don't want, of course, in the interest of safety, you don't want to come anywhere close to our threshold. But on the other hand, there is the performance overhead that is there uh, running at lower frequencies. I mean, the, the whole system is there. Why are we designing this? And suddenly we want to push the performance uh, uh, of the system to the extent um, but uh, this is a trade-off and a sort of a fine trade-off between the thermal safety on one side and how much you can, how much performance you can extract from the system. Copying data over uh, has penalties. There is a performance penalty in copying the data over. For that duration, the me memory is not available. It, but uh, uh, what else would you do? There are other. You could be aggressive with respect to the voltage scaling. Voltage need not. So voltage scaling is intermediate, right? The power off which we are doing here is the most aggressive, but you don't have to do that. You can save data. So power off requires us to move data out. But I could, uh, but memories uh, have several intermediate states. One of them could be that you just turn the voltage low enough that the data, data is retained, but not low enough, but not high enough that you can actually read that data. It's maintained, but uh, still there is a performance loss. So there are all these intermediate uh, steps that are available. I, so uh, this is just the uh, introduction and therefore uh, I have not given all of these. But in general, there is uh, one extent is uh, one extreme is uh, you uh, turn the power off. But the voltage scaling are, uh, you know, refers to several intermediate uh, steps that.
error of. I'll get to multi scaling as a mechanism uh, in the application specific context. Nonetheless, it is there in the general system. Um, let me move forward to the application specific part of it. Hopefully, the main ideas are clear, even though I didn't give the algorithmic details, but uh, uh, that's all right. The point of the tutorial was first to, of course, motivate what the problem is, and then we'll. Uh, go ahead to the application specific part of it to see um, how I can model my application uh, in a way that um, enables a system level optimization of it. Uh, <laughs> Does the temperature affect uh, latency in LED? The temperature of the bottom layer is much higher. Let's say I'm continuously using it. And the temperature of the bottom layer of the memory is much higher as compared to the top. So if I compare the latency and so forth as a temperature increases, this does my access to that layer, but the time in, in which I access that layer also increases or it decreases or what happens? Because if there is a concept called invert, temperature inversion as well, right? Right. If it is fabricated in power 20 parameter and then if it is fabricated in filter, how does it vary? Um, for the DRAM systems, we ought to um, respect whatever the system, uh, the memory designer has told us with respect to the latency. The temperature is, uh, so we will not assume that the delay is being affected by the temperature. If they say, so whatever the access time that is given to us, if it is 20 nanoseconds or whatever they say, that let us assume is uh, true for true independent of what the temperature is. So this is a, a pessimistic number that we are choosing. There is a dependence, but the system designer would typically um, not assume different delays uh, for different temperature. The way it is affecting delays for us is that uh, we may be aggressively shutting off the system or doing DVFS or some such thing. Uh, that will affect the delays. Like uh, if I'm going to shut down the system and if there is overhead with respect to data copying. So we should assume that that's the sort of uh, in the memory systems. This is what the interface usually is. You don't assume a temperature dependence, but uh, you assume a safe uh, uh, latency for the access. But let's move on to the application specific uh, part of it uh, to conclude this part of the presentation. Um, the, so I have introduced a processor there also because of course the DRAM system is not uh, working on its own. It is uh, working in conjunction with um, what could be a multi-core processor here. Just uh, I've uh, uh, put this kind of a picture just because that is the theme of this uh, tutorial. And uh, it is so the large bandwidth that you demand from such uh, uh, 3D memory systems typically comes from large amounts of computation that would come would be there in this uh, sort of system. Now, whether it's a processor or it's some accelerator and that is sending that is the detail. But um, let's assume these are applic processors that are running applications. But there may be a large number of cores that is actually generating the traffic that is happening. So. That picture that I've shown there on the right is uh, a mapping structure they use in the HPM memory. I said that the vertical, the channel was defined in terms of a vertical stack, right? In the, in the other picture, which was the HMC. In the HBM uh, mapping that uh, people use nowadays, uh, this is a little more complex than that. The reasons, among other things, the standard probably is anticipating the thermal issues that come up uh, in the other picture, but um, channel zero may be distributed like that. Uh, if you have two stacks here, you could have a four way stack or an eight way stack in the future that might that stacking might actually go even higher. But um, the channel is distributed physically in an eight way stack where uh, you have a channel zero here and a channel zero here. one here and one here. This separated out in the interest of um, um, of thermal, among other things, just because you know, if uh, uh, let's say a particular channel has high traffic, you, know, you by separating out uh, somehow the thermal uh, effect is better. Adjacency is bad uh, when two channels are very active and very hot. So this might be the picture that we are talking about, and. Uh, a dynamic thermal management has to be defined in uh, you know over and above an architecture like this so it may be that a particular processor core is mapped to a particular channel here so that core is mapped to channel so data for that core is um, distributed across those two 
uh, dyes that form the channels. Uh, similarly, for others, um, for that core, it may be that it is across uh, uh, channel six and so on. Um, so each of the cores would be associated with the two of the channel. You see, this is a different picture which is deliberately done uh, just so that we understand that um, um, that mapping is in some ways in, is in our hands, we uh, the designers uh, hands. The standard might actually impose some uh, architectural constraints. Uh, the division, uh, uh, the mapping and the division, this is part of the standard, but um, um, so I mean, what channel zero maps to, what channel one maps to physically, that might be defined by the standard. But um, this, um, what core zero maps to, what uh, what channel core zero maps to, what channel processor core one or two they map to, that might be actually in our hands. And uh, in an application specific system, we might actually more aggressively um, in a uh, in a general purpose computing system, maybe there are, that also is some uh, you know, is standardized in some way, but uh, those are the things that we might want to look into in an application specific system. Right. Yeah, uh, what I wanted to show is both the extremes. The first one in which we said all ranks, all parts of the memory, all channels are accessible to all the cores. That was one uh, uniform uh, assumption that we had made. This is the other extreme where I'm saying that a core has its data in particular channels. In reality, uh, you might have. OK, so such a mapping might be there. Uh, it it makes sense in the interest of uh, somehow isolating our data that's there for one application from what is there in the other application. In general, it is actually, of course, an open problem whether uh, you should share everything or whether you should partition uh, the memories uh, in some way that we will not get to. But let me get to the application um, specific nature uh, uh, of this optimization. Uh, the uh, application specific nature means I have to define the application. Uh, this picture needs no definition, no explanation by now everybody is an expert on, <laughs> on what it means. Uh, there are all these layers. Um, uh, the layer term is going to be uh, overused a little bit because in the DRAM architecturally they are, there are layers and the neural networks uh, also here there are layers so I have to somehow use some other terminology like tier or something like that. But uh, the DNNs uh, execute in phases. I have taken here an example neural network uh, strategy, but in fact, you'll see that the mapping, uh, uh, that there is a nice mapping of the computation that happens in these neural networks and what is it that we want to be sensitive to in the management. So the thing is, uh, within a layer, these are deeply nested loops. If you have seen the computation of the layers in the neural network, the be memory behavior does not change much within a neural network layer, but on a transition from one layer to another, you may have a very different uh, sort of uh, behavior. So that's what we want to be sensitive to. The off-chip data access rate actually depends on the layer's footprint, memory footprint, and that memory footprint uh, is largely okay. The behavior uh, is stable within a layer, but uh, on a layer transition, you expect uh, changes. That's the transition that we want to capture and we want to act upon with respect to our uh, uh, management of the memory. Uh, what this picture is showing here is uh, memory accesses on the vertical axis, and as time progresses on a particular neural network execution, uh, you see that um, uh, they, these refer to the transition. Wherever changes are there, that's where there is a layer uh, transition, uh, and uh, that actually in software it gives us a handle that uh, because there is a transition here, I can anticipate what's coming next and uh, adjust my management accordingly if i'm if i have so um, in the general case in the runtime system you have to look at the traffic and make inferences that okay so some changes have happened in the nature in the behavior of the program and therefore i should adapt uh, but in an application specific system assuming that we are allowed to intervene um, we know that the transition is going to happen that is where the application specific uh, nature comes in which is from one layer to the next layer i know that uh, this is what is the expected behavior in, in the uh, next layer. So that gives us a hook into the management of the system. 
Um, I'll omit some of those details here, but uh, what this picture is showing is the correspondingly what temperatures we are seeing on the, on that HBM system. When I run uh, the, um, this is a different neural network, but uh, the VGG16 is the other network. But uh, these changes in the phase are actually something that um, show up as temperature effect changes because the behavior is changing and those actually nicely correspond to layer transitions giving us a hook into the management of the system yeah taking parallels from the deep neural networks or are you creating data interviews it is doing inference uh, so yeah the architecture what you are the, so the processor course that I had in uh, in that picture, there is a memory system and a processor core system. The processor core is running the DNN. So that 16 uh, uh, tile that was there, right, four by four course. So it's actually the 16 instances of this uh, uh, neural network are actually running on that processor in software. Require huge amounts of data. That is true. Uh, the data has to come from somewhere, right? So one level is our memory system that we are talking about. There may be a backup uh, layer. Uh, also, maybe it is disk or, or somewhere else from where or network from where it is coming. But definitely more than. Yeah, memory. sure. A lot more than fits into the DN, uh, into the uh, HBM memory. That that's all right. Images are the inputs to this uh, these neural network, so that is the that is what forms the data for us. Uh, the processor course they have uh, the neural network running. The data is coming from the memory for us, but uh, this isn't the last level of the memory. There there are caches uh, within the processor. SVM is there, and then the next level would be whatever we want it to be. That is not modeled here, uh, but uh, this is we are studying only the SVM. Anyway, let me move ahead to the sort of management that is involved here. I also want to conclude the, this discussion, but uh, there is a task to core mapping uh, in the general case. There is so first we said there is a core to memory mapping. The processor cores were storing their data in accessing data from particular channels in the memory. Then there is a thing of the task. Uh, we'll uh, define that what the task is here, but conceptually, whatever that that this is independent of whether it is what kind of application is running. But the task need to be run in particular course, and uh, there is uh, the opportunity to uh, to intervene there. Um, efficient mapping of the task uh, would be best illustrated through an example here. Um, if we say that our cores are here mapped to our channels and these channels we already know where the heat sink is and therefore what to expect. Um, we can group the cores in some ways uh, where maybe heavy tasks could be uh, mapped to the channels that are uh, um, higher up so that they are closer to the heat sink and the medium ones uh, uh, perhaps somewhere in the middle and maybe the light ones uh, towards the um, towards the lower section of the HPM. This is really uh, conceptually what would be there in a task to core mapping without going into too much detail there. But um, this is just uh, uh, taking cognizance of the thermal gradient that is there in the HPM system. After the task to core uh, mapping, uh, which so which means that if it is a light task, it could go anywhere. If it is a medium task, then it could go to some of these. If it is a heavy task, then it could go to uh, even. So the restriction is even more. What kind of task is coming up is something that we already know uh, because of the nature of the application that is there in our hands, right? So all the layers are not equal. And which layers are the ones that are likely to interfere with the thermal aspects? That's something that uh, we understand enough about the, uh, the system by a separate profiling uh, and so on. So this is where there is an application specific hook that is there for us. Um, let me quickly move on to what other um, um, 
mechanisms we have. Task migration is certainly something that we ought to be open to. We run something there, uh, but then that's are coming dynamically. I don't know all the task, the profile of the tasks ahead of time. So I ought to be managing the system through some kind of a task migration uh, mechanism. These, of course, the hooks for that are already there in modern systems, operating systems do that uh, all the time. And uh, what uh, the pictures like these are showing um, is that upon a layer transition, uh, there is the opportunity to migrate uh, tasks in some way. So if I have, uh, let's say, there was a task that was a light task, but uh, I mean that that four was a light task, but now that uh, uh, the layer transition happened, uh, the next layer is a heavy one. So that's what is being shown by the color here. Then we can move that uh, corresponding uh, task from uh, from here, which is a lighter core into this one, uh, which is the heavier core. And this is just showing the processor part of it, but then the, the mapping from the memory establishes that it is going to a place which is actually maybe higher up so that the dissipation is better for it. So that's the sort of a, so the picture here, uh, these are logical pictures, but uh, hopefully we have established the connection with the physical structure and where the dynamic thermal management is happening. So that's about the migration. I could swap applications uh, if it turns out that uh, one of them, uh, so let's say one of so that nine that I have, so, so there's a new task that, so that nine I had here is uh, changing its layer. So from a pool layer to a convolution layer, which is actually uh, heavier, and uh, that may, uh, might give us an opportunity to do a swapping of the tasks. Um, let me also move on to a DVFS uh, sort of a thing. It could also be that I, uh, it's not as the cores are available, but uh, uh, but still the transition has happened with respect to light, uh, you know, a motion from a light uh, layer to a heavy layer. Then, of course, if I don't have a choice with respect to mapping, the DVFS is uh, an opportunity for us, so I can reduce the frequency. So still a working system, not as optimal as we would like it to be with respect to speed, uh, but uh, nevertheless, it's an opportunity for us to uh, continue. So. Uh, the drastic action is there at the end that uh, we could uh, shut off actually parts of the channel, but that's something that we want to do only if we run out of all the other options, uh, task mapping, migration, uh, DVFS, these are intermediate solutions uh, for us, which could continue uh, the process, uh, which could permit us to continue the execution, uh, if not optimally. Uh, and finally, there is a, the DRAM itself has some opportunities for uh, uh, moving into a low power uh, system and so on. So if one or more channels is heated, uh, of course, I could move it uh, to uh, standby. Standby means that it is uh, running at a lower voltage rate, but essentially um, things are disabled, access is disabled. Data is still saved, but access is disabled. You can see that this is a nice intermediate solution uh, over that does not have the uh, overheads of copying of the data. Uh, this, we are talking about large amounts of data here, of course. So it could be that uh, uh, the heater channels are on standby, and once enough time has passed, the, the we have recovered uh, through the cooling process, then we could go back uh, to uh, the normal active mode. So um, let me stop there with respect to the interventions, the optimizations that are there. We didn't go into the algorithm level, but hopefully conceptually what uh, the, the knobs that are available to us, uh, those are clear. That was really the intention of this part of the tutorial. I should point out um, that uh, the thermal simulation infrastructure that uh, we uh, that uh, uh, can be used for these things that is uh, uh, that is usually an integration of several tools. There is a performance simulation that is happening. There is a power simulation that is simultaneously happening of the memory parts of it. Since we are focusing on memory here, uh, uh, but uh, also simultaneously there is a thermal simulation. You do need all of these to happen together both uh, to discover what's going on and also to understand the impact of uh, certain algorithms that we have with respect to system level control. Um, what I have shown there is a sort of uh, a snapshot of a video that is generated uh, from the tool uh, comment here that is helping us uh, doing this. And um, um, you could uh, configure the architectures in some many different uh, uh, ways. Maybe it is a 2D, maybe it is a 2.5D, or maybe it is uh, a 3D in the tool. And uh, uh, 
um, well, I will not go into the all the details, but essentially there is a tool chain uh, that is quite complex. We do need to take uh, traces from somewhere. We need um, memory models. Um, you are accessing memory. How much power is dissipated? The, some models are necessary. Uh, so uh, without going into the into the details, I thought I'll just uh, put this up. These are uh, available open source uh, um, uh, and uh, actively worked upon by by uh, several of us. So let me conclude that with, with, with this part of the uh, presentation, uh, but I'll be happy to take any brief questions. Um, Maybe we'll take questions after three. We Perhaps. Ask any yeah. You're We're need running to. out of time. So we'll just thank you. Thank you very much, Preeti. Please thank uh, Rosa Panda. And we will now start on the video from uh, Hello, my name is Sina Kujina. I am an aesthetic leader at the Chair of the Basic Council Council. Yeah. Sorry, the other room is not getting the. There, there are some overflow room apparently, and the other room is not getting um, the sound. So give us a few minutes to put the sound right. Same content. It will going to share the tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So do you want to maybe come back to this later? Huh? After after the break. So that we talk another talk. Sure. But you have to check it. We'll check. If you are getting a video, if you do a kind of open, you should be kind of a call to Then after the break, you can you can sort that out. Even that palette, you will be fixing it. Sorry, yeah.
So we'll come back to this talk a little later because of the, te the technical problems. We'll come back to this talk. We'll um, go on to Professor Sonia's talk on, on, on network on chips and look at how communication affects application specific systems. All right, just a minute. So come back. Uh, go ahead. Uh, maybe. How much time do I have? You, 40 minutes. Uh, 40 minutes. Yeah. So they could. Yeah, they got a small break and then. Sure, sure. Yeah, Wrong one. This has to be closed, right? Close your yeah. escape. It. This one. Is it on? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Oh, he had really done. This is a bit. Okay. Yes, yes. Is it shared? Is it shared? Yes, it's No, no, no. In the teams, they are sharing, right? No, teams only we need to share. Already sharing is there, right? Yeah, they are content already there. Now here, here this is appearing, right? Yeah, I think it's Yeah, a very good morning, all of you. So sorry for the swapping of the talks. Uh, so till now we uh, were discussing about uh, fr from uh, Professor Preeti, we understood that the task to core mapping and uh, memory has been done. So in this case, we see a little different perspective of the mapping. So we are going to go into the details of those mappings from the on chip perspective. So the title of this part of the tutorial would be optimization of on-chip networks for general and application specific multiprocessor architecture. So let us say one by one. So first of all, on-chip network. So we'll be first discussing about what exactly an on-chip network is, why it is required, and that is for general and as well as application specific kind of architectures. So we will be taking a problem in a general architecture and as well as for the application specific multiprocessor architectures. And we are going to see how do we do optimization in these two perspectives. So I will be giving uh, a detailed uh, view of two of the optimization techniques which our group have developed for these general as well as application specific architectures. So before moving to the actual talk, so we'll see why do we really require a network on chip. So everybody, we, we have seen the multiprocessor architectures now where the processes are being communicated using different buses, standard buses. So most of the industries you may be hearing about AXI, AMB, and there are a lot of other protocols which are being used. So as the number of processes on chip grow are growing. So the bandwidth is getting shared. So because of that, the latency issues would come up. So that is where this network on a chip comes in. So this is how it looks like with this. This is through the bus, right? So whenever there is a communication that is happening inside the multiprocessor environment, so the other one has to wait because there is a single bus. Rather, in this case, you don't need to wait. There can be parallel communication within the multiprocessors that can happen. So the advantage is being there's a lot of parallelism that can happen while doing the communication, and we can reuse it, and it's scalable. So we will see like how much we, it can be scalable. So as the number of processors on chip are increasing, it is still able to provide 
good performance. So to understand the basics of this, so basically we have in a multiprocessor environment, we have processes, more than one processor, could be thousand processes. They are connected in a fashion through a network. So and those networks are connected via something called routers, which are participated in the communication. So each of the router is connected to a processor. So there could be more than one processor also per router. And those routers are connected in a fixed way or in a a custom way so that we are going to see how they are going to be connected and this in this particular slide they are connected in a mesh fashion so all those r which is represented over here i hope you can see the cursor no i think right you can't see the cursor this this Use the laser. Okay. okay. Yeah, thank you. So this P is what represents a processing element or the processor. It could be an accelerator, it could be a memory, it could be anything which is doing the processing. And we have the one which are represented with R, those are the routers which are connected in this particular network. And there is something called NI, which is a network interface, as the name says, it is an interface between the cores and the network. So this is how a typical NOC looks like. So you can see that this is how the communication happen over there. So yeah. I'll, I'll come to that. I'll come to that at the route. So before moving to this particular one, so everybody knows that these are the typical VLSA CAD problems we come across. There's a mapping problem. There's a flow planning or placement problem. We have routing, buffer sizing. We have timing closures, simulations and testing because there are many more. I have listed a few of it. So now how these CAD problems are going to be translated in this particular domain, which is NOC. So as I said in the previous talk, we have seen how the tasks are being mapped onto the course. So here we assume that the task to core mapping has already been done and the cores are given to us. And there are multiple cores of such thing. So they could be homogeneous or heterogeneous. So taking those cores into consideration and we have a network with us now. So how are you going to map those cores or the processes onto the network is my application mapping problem. And another thing is, how am I going to do the floor planning? Because it's not only processes now, rather we have different other elements also along with the processes. So what are the different challenges one has to look into whenever somebody wants to do a floor planning? And of course, it's all about, NOC is all about the communication. So how are you going to do the communication? So there are different routing methodologies one has to look into while we work on these problems. And of course, one of the attendees were asking about the buffer, right? Yes, of course, you require FIFOs. So we have smaller FIFOs in the routers while you are transferring some messages. So we do have flexibility in this particular buffer sizing. Of course, it is application specific. So we can have different types of buffer widths and sizes over there. So how well you can actually change the size of those buffer inside is also a problem to be considered. And another thing is, since you are giving a proposal of a new thing which is coming onto the chip, so how are you going to do the simulation of these things? How well I understand that the network that I'm going to connect is going to give me good performance in terms of the, in terms of the communication because processes are doing the computation. So how well am I going to do the communication? Because I'm providing the solution for the communication, the communication should not really have a bottleneck over computation. So I need to have some kind of simulation environment and I will be giving a demonstration on that. So how do we simulate it? How do we simulate the traffic? How do we actually capture the performance metrics of this particular complete NOC? And other, there are different other NOC design problems like instead of connecting those networks, the, the networks in a fixed fashion, can't I make it custom made? 
So it's like very specific to a application. So that is what is we call it as topology synthesis. So there are many others like inside the architectures, you have different channels and the different types of flow control mechanisms and arbitration techniques. So there are many, many problems, but I have listed only a few and we are going to see one or two problems out of this. So as I said that it's a network. So network is something which is connected. So we call that as a topology. So you know, see, topology is a connection between actually the net routers and routers are being connected to the processing element. So this is how uh, different types of network topologies look like. This is a very typical mesh network. This is how it looks like and it has its own routing algorithms, very well known routing algorithms. So if this is a source and destination, it follows a fixed routing pattern and reaches the destination. And there are many others. This is called torus. Octagon. So there are many, many, if you consider a general purpose topologies. So one has to take that whether you want to take one of these topologies into consideration while you do a mapping or you want to design your own topology. That's called a custom topology. So this is another one is called a factory. So these are different ways of connecting these routers with the processors. So well, so having these, yes. OK, yeah. OK, so there are uh, some characteristics to each of the topology. So sometimes it because in this particular case, the topology is already given to you. So it is up to you whether you want to choose it or don't don't use it. Still yeah, this may not be true. Yeah, so normally they go for mesh and torus kind of a thing. So these are kind of you just want to check if you want to connect more than one processing element onto one particular router and see whether it works properly. So the, for those kind of checkings, you may actually use this, but normally mesh and torus kind of rectangular types are used. Well, so if anybody would want to design such an architecture, what they need to look for. So first of all is you can have any of these regular NOCs. You fix their topology and then you take an application. So application is an input to me. And I take that application and do a mapping on to this. Any of the topology that you choose. And another one is you take the application as an input, but I don't fix my topology. Rather, I would do my own design of the topology. So that's called the irregular. And so it may not be regular in nature always. So it's called a custom or an application specific. And the other version of it is you don't have one application, but rather you have multiple applications at hand. Then you may have to figure out how do I do the reconfiguration within the net. So that's completely a different domain which we are not really going to discuss today. So first of all, we will look into application mapping problem in detail. So if time permits, we'll also look into custom topology design also. So as I said, for the application mapping problem, application is an input to me and as well as the fixed topologies input to me. So it depends upon what topology you have actually chosen. The way you do the mapping differs. So let us just fix one. I'm just fixing mesh for time being and I have the application and application is given in terms of graph like this, where the nodes are representing the cores which will do the computation. So as I said, I, I take it for granted that the core task to core mapping has already been done and cores are ready with the computation and they want to communicate with other cores. That is my problem here. So and I'm worried more about the communication rather than the computation within the core here. So this particular node is a computation node, it could be core or a processor, accelerator, anything it could be. And the edges that represent the bandwidth requirement between the processes. In this case, it is megabits per second. So you can give me any application which would look like this. So this is one of the inputs, which is an application in terms of, we call it as a core graph, the graph which is made of cores as nodes. And I fixed it as a mesh topology. 
so I can have two different problems here mapping and as well as scheduling because not only the mapping where these cores are going to go and sit on this network, rather we also have to see when each core is actually being communicated to what. So here we are going to see only the mapping, not the scheduling aspects of it. So this is how it looks like. So I take those cores as some blocks and I've taken it a mesh network. So how am I going to place those blocks onto the network is my problem. So basically this has been proven to be an NP hard problem, non polynomial. So there are many, many techniques that come across while we solve this problem. So I'll show you why this problem is a real problem to be solved. So let us take only a core graph having only five cores. Five cores is really a small number. But let me just show you how difficult to solve this problem with only five cores. And since I have got five cores and I'm considering one core to one router. So obviously I require at least five routers in my network. I'm considering mesh. I cannot have five network, right? So I need to have six. So either I can take two cross three or three cross two. In this case, I took three cross two. Now I just gave one solution as that C1, C2 like this, keeping this empty because I, I, I don't have enough cores to be accommodated in all the routers. So this is one solution, right? But how do I know that this is a good solution? There has to be some objective function which would determine that yes, whatever I'm doing is the correct way of doing it because the whole purpose of doing this is to optimize the communication. So the communication overhead has to be reduced. So in this, I define the objective function as the communication cost where it is defined as summation over all the edges. That is basically the bandwidth requirements. Bandwidth, which is an input to me, and there is something called number of halves which can be changed according to the solution I am going to provide. So for example, this particular mapping of C1 sitting over here, C2 here and so on, I can see here that C1 to C2, there is a communication bandwidth requirement at 20. And in this particular solution, C1, C2 are adjacent to each other. So I require only one hop. So I do 20 multiplied by one and so on, which I do for all the edges in the application graph I have got here. So I'm getting around 290 as the communication cost. So can anybody comment whether this is the best one? Or can I improve upon it? Well, in at this point of time, I'm not really going into the routing aspects of it. I'm only looking at the Sure. Come again. Yeah, it, it may be suboptimal. So can we do the best out of it? Can we find a best solution from this? Yes. What has to be inserted? C3 is inserted. Yes, there are five which are already mapped. C3 should be central. Oh, C3 has to change its place to somewhere else. OK, like there are many, many solutions, right? So suppose if at all, if it is 32 cores instead of five, so I've got these many combinations. And if each of the combination to calculate this cost, if it takes 0 0.001 millisecond, it would take these many billion years to exhaustively search each solution to get the best one. So only for 32 cores. So now you can imagine how big the problem is. Right? So we have solved for this. It's a very small one to this. So the best cost you can get is 210. Of course, I didn't give the mapping solution yet, but 210 is the best solution with different orientations of this C1 going here, C3 going here, and so on. So I hope the problem is clear. So there are many, many options for us. So we need to pick the best from it because our objective is to reduce the communication cost. So our approach is we have done the mathematical modeling of it. 
and we also have used some of the heuristics to solve this particular problem. So I'll be talking about only a few of the techniques that we have used for this particular problem. So one particular thing which we have used for this NP hard problem is to model mathematically using something called integer linear programming. So this is more from the mathematics stuff. So let us see how exactly this would solve our problem. Yes. Yeah, this is only for this particular one. Yes. So later, if the problem is different, then we may have to go for different other solutions. So it's not only ILP which we have provided, we also have different heuristic solutions and ILP will not work for the higher application sizes also. Not really. I will show you like how we can change it. I'm just taking an example as a mesh. It does not mean that it would only work for mesh. There should be little changes one has to do to work for other topologies. So basically, this gives the exact solution, but for a very smaller kind of an application size, it takes a lot of time. So you might ask me then, why do I really have to go for it? Because it gives exact solution. So I try for smaller application sizes and show that this is the best solution. Then I go for some other solution, heuristic based solutions and say that this heuristic solution is matching the solution quality with the one which is mathematically proved. So that is why I go for ILP. So there are many uh, solvers to solve these uh, ILP formulations. So we have used something called CPLEX, which is available uh, open source. This is from IBM. So one has to, first of all, to apply this ILP, one has to understand why do we really have to do this. So first of all, the objective has to be clear. So one has to define the objectives properly. So the objective function has to be defined in a mathematical way. Number one. Number two is how the constraints are being defined. So for a given problem, for a given optimization problem, how these constraints are being defined and then how your solution should look like. So these are the three things one has to look into whenever somebody wants to apply this technique for any any optimization for that matter. So I'm only showing one of the optimization problems which we solved with this. So as I said, like here, our objective is to minimize the communication cost. So sometimes there may be some maximization objective functions also where you do the maximization and subject to some constraints. Right? So for this particular problem of application mapping, so how do we actually formulate this objective function? So as I said, that the communication cost is defined as bandwidth multiplied by the number of hops over all the edges. So I, please don't get scared with all IJs and all. It's very easy. So you can see here that it has to be on all the edges. I cannot leave any edge. So it has to be on all edges and bandwidth of that particular edge. So this is not in my hands. Bandwidth is given to me because application is an input to me. And what is in my hands is only the number of hops. And as I said, for this particular problem, my topology is fixed. So I know from each of the router to each of the router how many hops it would take typically if I consider an XY routing algorithm in an ideal situation, how many hops each to each is taking. So I keep those D, R, S, R, T. So that is like R, S is one router, R, T is another router. So S varies from all to all. If I take like two by three or so, so S varies from one to six. T also varies from one to six, of course. S and T cannot be equal. So I do this, keep it aside. So now I have all the information about the topology also. Now the question is where each of these cores are going to go and sit in my network. So that would be we are getting from a variable, which is a binary variable, which is called this. So CI, CJ are the cores which I have got from the graph. And this RSRT is the network, which is a router network. 
So now we need to understand which of the CI CJs are going and sitting in which of the RS and RT. So that is my problem. So once I know this, suppose if I say PC1, C2, so for the example of this, here I can say that PC1 is going and sitting on R1 and C2 is going sitting in R2. So I can say that PC1, C2, R1, R2, something like that. So for a given size, you are I, J, S, S and T values. So that is how you need to substitute over here. Well, so that is objective function, but we need to also define the constraints. So here the constraints are only one core to one router I am considering. Of course, you can also change the constraints to be like I can connect two to one because I've in, in, in factory topology, you have four cores connected to one router. So there you can change the constraint. This is what I was telling you. Like this is written for mesh that two for one core to one router. Rather, you can also change the number of cores per router by changing the constraints over here whether it is equal to one or equal to four or equal to two, depending upon how many number of cores that you would want to connect it to a router. So mapping, so th these are the constraints. So in this case, the constraint is only one to one mapping I'm going to do. So considering this particular variable, which I call it as a mapping variable, which is again a binary variable, which is called MCI RS, which says this MCI RS is equal to one whenever a core CI is mapped onto RS, otherwise it's zero. So we can understand that I cannot have a core which is unconnected. That's why this is summing up to one. And that has to be true over all the routers. Because once a core is connected to one router, it should not be connected to other routers anymore. I hope you're following. Me. Right? It has to be. No, it is a router who which is empty. It is never the core that is. No, neither the cores. These are cores. These are cores. The blocks, I didn't name them. They are routers basically. This is a router network. This is a core graph. So I cannot have any core which is not connected to the router, but I can have routers which can be empty. So that's why I showed this example. Which one? Yes, here. Yes. 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 Of course, it will take us two hops because the router, even though it is not connected to any core, it will not be participating in the local communication of core to router, but it is still participating in the network communication. So definitely it will be involved. So that is where the question, right? If you if you have a network which is having a routers much more than the number of cores, the problem becomes even more harder. Right, so because whether where should I keep that empty? That's again a question, but it would definitely uh, would would be there in the communication. I cannot make the uh, network to be disconnected, right? So it has to be there. So from this, we understand that the cores cannot be left open without connecting to any uh, routers, but the routers can be empty. So that is where the second constraint says, that's why it is less than or equal to one. It could be zero from the router's perspective. And of course it has to be on all the cores. No, because it basically if you see both of them, what we are doing is only making sure that it is one to one mapping. Only thing is first one equivalent, con this particular constraint is from the course perspective and this is from the router's perspective. Maybe if we elaborate by taking an example that would make it things more clear. Like if you say that for the same problem, this one, so you can say MC1 R1 is one. At the end of my simulation, that is my solution, right? MC1 R1 is equal to zero. So if I see from the C1's perspective, so you can write this equation and the, of course it is going to get satisfied. 
And if I write from R one's perspective, it is going to be equal to one because there is a core which is already connected. Yeah, exactly. So if if it is R three, it is R three. So obviously it is going to become zero. So it is less than one. So that's how it is. Well, so if you give these constraints in the object, if the constraint complete pool to the tool, it will only give those feasible solutions because the constraints are such that the feasible solution would fall under these constraints. We are always sure of it. We can still let the first problem. Yeah, sorry, I think in the interest of time, I, I just have to skip a bit. So these are the mapping constraints and there is something called after you map it, there has to be some path in the network that one has to look into, right? So this particular constraint would actually uh, help it solve. Maybe offline I can give an example and then uh, solve this. So we have another way of looking at this solution, which is a heuristic. So there are many, many heuristics. So we, I just have chosen uh, particle swarm optimizer. It's a very well known uh, heuristic, uh, 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 you know, to, to solve these optimization problems. So the only thing, if anybody wants to apply these techniques, one has to understand the terminology and how do we frame the problem. So for ILP, as we are framing the objective function and the constraints in terms of the inequations. So similarly, one has to understand how do you structure your solution? And there is something called objective function, which we call it as fitness. So I'll just go a little faster from here. So it's basically you have different birds and they are looking for food and we don't the, the birds. They don't know where the food is. Right, so they were trying to find out and they were trying to adopt themselves by seeing their past and as well as their neighbors past and trying to go towards the food. They are trying to update their velocity and position and finally come up with a solution. So that's the whole idea. I'm going very fast. So for the same problem, how do we structure it? So for a for anybody to apply this PSO for a, an optimization problem, one has to structure the solution. So here bird or a particle is a solution. So it's an array. Where the entries of the array represents the core numbers from the core graph and the indices represent the router number. So particle is nothing but the permutations of these numbers. So if I say this, that means core one is connected to router zero core six is to one and so on. So if I simply change the entries of these array, the solution would vary. And obviously if the solution varies, my object to function is going to vary. So I am going to see how well I am going to swap these. So if you Google like you get lot of PSO kind of material. So one, one has to just understand how do we structure it. And there are some swap operators like this. It goes into the evolution process and gets into the place where it would give me the best solution or maybe suboptimal solution, which is much, much better than the exhaustive search kind of a thing. So I'm not really going into the details of it. This is static because application mapping, we are just taking it as static. We have got dynamic things also, which I'm not really showing now. So we have done analysis on the results also, which we, uh, so as I said, like we have gone to 10 by 10, we also have gone till 32 by 32 and it was showing good results. As I said, we are more worried about the communication. So obviously the latency plays a major role. So we have seen that we could get better latency results from the techniques that we applied. OK, so I have five minutes. Right? Yeah. Can we go back one second? Yeah. Honestly, how did you get better results from PSO there? Which one? The next slide, next slide. Here, no, no, it's not. Here, no, because ILP couldn't run because VOPD was too big. So that was not the best solution which I got. So you can see here that. OK, here there is star you see for VOPD. It just went out of memory. So wherever it got stopped, we had to take that suboptimal solution. So if you have good resources, yes, it would run. Yes, that's the reason the latency is kind of less. Actually, it is not less, but the given solution, it is less. Yes. 
yes of course as i said like i just showed pso and we have tried out different algorithms pso happens to be best for this particular kind of a thing well if you have enough time and you can try out you, you yeah but but it all also depends upon the nature of the problem you are looking at it so i cannot say that pso is going to work for all the optimization problems so this particular problem is of such a nature that we could get we tried different others also so that is the reason we have the benchmark of ilp here that is the motivation of going for it well No, it okay. Well, it is not. Uh, it is a fact of parallel that ILP is used for uh, find the exact correct solution, but it takes a long time. Yes, so it's a heuristic thing. It's just luck. Get the solution is luck. That's why I think it is some ways it's one way or the other. Way. So we have to finish our problem. Yeah, we'll quickly. Yeah, we can't say that this is the optimum solution that I'm going to get with PS. So never. So we are lucky. Yes, we are going to get it. And so uh, till this point, we have seen for the generic NOC where topology is fixed. So this is where you can have your custom topology made. I think I'll skip these things and go to the simulator which we have developed for this particular thing to do this as I showed different uh, latency results and all. So, so we have developed a NOC simulator in house which would take the actual application traffic which I have showed as a core graph. It would take the network as such like what would be the router connections that it has. It will take and then give the as latency calculations, power calculations and so on. Because whenever we are putting NOC over there, I cannot simply say that OK, only calculating the communication cost, getting a lesser communication cost will not really give me the justification. Rather, I have to do the actual network simulations to understand the concession, whether it is happening in the real network while I'm sending the actual application specific traffic to it. So our simulator, it would take router connection file, router connection file meaning the topology basically. Indirectly, I'm giving the topology and core communication file meaning the core graph. Those two are the inputs for this particular problem, right? So and we have some arguments which we can okay. Like somebody was asking about the routing. So we do have routing options over here. Well, we see you can see here you we have different options here also. So this is the router. I didn't go to the details of it. We have a router architecture with us, which we are using underlying. Right. So in this case, we have used eight and as six as different uh, options which we have, but later we have got other options also. So it all depends upon what exactly your application needs and that's you can change it from the command. So for example, this particular network, so you can give it like this, that if I'm talking about router one, what are the different things one has connected to it? So since it is having a routing algorithm, it needs to have some addressing scheme. So let us say this is the address 00 for R1, and it is connected to R3 on the right side and nothing on top and left because it's a corner router. And there is another one on the downstairs, which is R2. And because I have already done the application mapping with any of the algorithms, and then I'm going for the simulation in this particular NOC simulator. I know the mapping also. So I know which core has already been connected there. So I do connect the core. So core number also I give. And as I said, buffer also can be, the size can be varied. So I give this information to all the routers network. So this, gives a 
connection pattern of the router to the simulator. Basically, we are giving the topology information and as well as the application mapping information to it. And coming to this core, so this is like see how many cores are there I mentioned and each core with how many cores it is communicating to and with what bandwidth it is communicating to. I just mentioned over here and give some commands. So I'll just give you one example. So for this benchmark application, so you can see there are 12 cores. So I see 12 here and C1 is talking to only this. So I just give one and what is the bandwidth requirement? So something like this, I give it as application traffic file. And this is the network that I'm going to give. So as I explained, so this is how we are going to give. And depending upon what exactly I would want to choose, like I have different options over here, the number of routers and number of global links. Global links meaning the number of connections that one router can have that also can be varied from the runtime. And you have how many cores, as I said, like whether you want to connect one to one or two to one or four to one, that can also be varied. And how much time you want to simulate. And there is something called saturation time because network needs some time because there is some transition that happens. So it needs some time to saturate to take the results. So that also can be changed. And router connection file is an input that you can get it. And as I said that we can also use this for the custom topology. So if I'm not using mesh or a torus or a standard mesh ne any network, so I can also mention the complete router connection file in the way you want. It. So that is also an input. And you can have the standard way of routing algorithms as an input to it, or you can have table based routing also. If you know which one would go where beforehand, you can also mention in terms of the table based routing and there are others also or even routing and so on. There are many, many routing options one can give to the simulator for the simulator and the traffic also whether you want to you want the simulator to generate the traffic or you have your own specific traffic to the application. So that can also be changed and once you have a generic traffic, you can also mention what is the injection rate at which the traffic has to go inside. And you can mention different result folders and so on where you get the results. And this is how a typical output looks like. So you, you would have given some numbers over here, simulation time, two lakh clock cycles and 10,000 saturation time, how many routers, how many cores, how many links and so on. And you can see here for each of the core, how many packets have been sent from that particular core and how many have, be, have been received. And within the window means within this particular time that you have mentioned over here. So then total packet sent in the network and it, it is going to calculate the average network latency out of it. It is going to calculate the throughput and we have something called dot ACR files which can be used in synopsis design vision and prime which can be directly given and you can also get the power and Orient tool can also be uh, added to it which can be used to get the router power and we are also working on using the thermal uh, based calculations also by including hotspot also into it. So that is the extension that we are planning. So this is a typical simulator output that looks like. So this would be released soon, so it would be open source in a meanwhile. Yeah, so because I didn't go into the architecture, so it is divided in terms of fleets. So packets have been divided into fleets. It's a wormhole switching that we are using and we have four virtual channels for it. And we have also have uh, you can uh, you know decide number of virtual channels you can have in the network. More than? Yeah, this one. Now these are bidirectional links. What I'm saying about the virtual channels inside. Any more questions? Actually, we are thinking now at this point we are just trying to add different power and thermal simulators to it. Maybe it should be possible. Which one? Well, so we have also done some uh, analysis with the 
different com commercial NOC simulators available and it is matching with them. So if you can define your application so accurately, yes, we can give you the accurate traffic. It all depends upon the input that is given to our simulator. And uh, we have fixed one router architecture. If you have your own router architectures with some changes that can also be accommodated here. Are there any quick questions? I think, I think, yeah. So we'll have a small break. Let's go to uh, a cup of coffee, yeah. coffee, but while there, you can ask questions. Yeah. Sure. Yes, yes, you can have quick questions and then we'll take a break. No, we'll, maybe I'll, during the break. During we can the break. Yeah, I think I can be here and take, take questions. Yes. Feel free, whatever we can do, but I yeah. think we will have a great short break now. Yeah. Yeah. So we take start in five minutes, we'll start the video. So please come back quickly. Right. Thanks a lot. So bring your tea, uh, coffee, and come. See what I'm trying to say. Thank you. I think I didn't leave you much time. You <laughs> took about 40 minutes. Only 40? Sorry? Only 40? Maybe we'll be okay. I didn't take much. Sorry? It was understood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I teach you how to work at home. Yeah, ask me questions, yeah. answer questions like in a class. In, 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 because I was running out of time, I was telling Yeah, I think there is a there is a link click to you know on 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 Teams. You you're playing this on Teams. Yes, so on Teams when you're sharing it. Can you can you reshare it? Can you start again? You know when you share it. Yeah. So just stop it. Stop sharing. Okay. Now, now we just now just share. we will share. It's, uh, stop, 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 stop. Don't jump. Just uh, stop. Include. Ah, include sound. Computer sound. Okay. <laughs> Hello, my name is Hiba Kudur. I am a research group leader at the Chair of Embedded Systems in KIT. My research group works on developing smart resource management that employs powerful machine learning algorithms. In this tutorial, you can learn important information about resource management, its challenges, traditional techniques, and also the most recent ones. Let us start with some facts about the technology advancement in the integrated circuit industry. Indeed, the enabler of this advancement is the technology scaling, which
Hallo.
we are also not coming with that, that side only may be problem. Yes, sir.
complex functions and generalize to unseen data. Therefore, we use machine learning to introduce smart resource management techniques. Before presenting our techniques, let us introduce a quick background about machine learning. One of the main machine learning methods is supervised learning. The idea is to learn from examples. When we have input data and output data without knowing the function that maps input to output, we can use machine learning algorithm to build a model by training on some available training data. If trained well, the model should be able to infer accurate output data from unseen input data. One of the powerful machine learning algorithm is neural network. Obviously, supervised learning can be used when training data is available. The second machine learning method is reinforcement learning. The idea is to learn by trial and error. It does not depend on training data. An agent interacts with environment through actions that it makes based on observations of the environment states. And the goal is to maximize the reward, which is a single scalar value that evaluates the performance of the agents. The most fundamental algorithm for reinforcement learning is Q-learning. The idea is to quantify the quality of taking action A for state S using the reward value. The value is called Q-value. The Q-values of all action state pairs are stored in the so-called Q-table. Deep Q-learning is an advanced algorithm in which Q-table is replaced with a neural network that estimates Q-values of all actions for any given state S. The two learning techniques, supervised learning and reinforcement learning, are the main techniques that we use to enable smart resource management. There are three different approaches or patterns of using machine learning to support resource management. The first approach is predict impact of management actions. The second approach is to estimate hidden processor and application properties. The third approach is to directly learn management actions. In the first approach, we can predict the impact of potential resource management decisions on performance and power. For example, predicting the impact of potential mapping decisions on performance. To achieve this, at design time, we conduct the training via the following steps. First, we observe for many management decisions, example mapping, under many scenarios, like applications, how they impact performance and power, etc. Then, from these scenarios, we create training data and train the neural network model. At runtime, we first create candidate management decisions or actions, passes them to the model to perform prediction, rate each action based on predicted impact, perform action with the best rating. In the second approach, we use machine learning to predict metrics that are difficult or impossible to measure at runtime. For example, predicting the performance sensitivity of application to VF level changes. This is something that cannot be directly measured, but it can be learned from relevant performance counters. To achieve this, at design time, we conduct the training via the following steps. First obtain available measurements at design time and calculate the wanted labels, train the model based on these labels. At runtime, we call the model to predict the metrics, provide these predictions to resource management algorithm, and this algorithm will make decisions or the actions based on this information. In the third approach, machine learning will be used to directly learn management actions, which means we do not predict some properties first, 
and then use a rule-based resource management algorithm to make the decision, instead of that, the output of the model will be directly the resource management decision. For example, a model can be trained to predict the best VF levels of the course given the current performance counters. For this approach, two main learning algorithms can be used. The first one is reinforcement learning. The goal of the resource management will be formulated as a reward function, for instance, high reward for high performance. The agent will learn at runtime good resource management decisions by trial and error. The second algorithm is imitation learning. Imitation learning uses supervised learning at design time to learn resource management decisions. Training data in this case will be optimal resource management decisions for some scenarios. It is common to extract training data by brute force research. That means trying all possible resource management decisions to determine the optimal one. At design time, the model is trained on this training data. At runtime, we pass system state to the model to directly infer the best action and executing it. Now, we will present our recent work that introduces smart resource management techniques. We selected one technique per approach. Following the first approach, we introduce a smart mapping technique where machine learning is used to predict the impact of mapping candidates to select the best one. We introduce smart boosting technique, which follows the second approach. The last technique is smart task migration technique, which follows the third approach. Let us start with smart mapping. In this work, we target clustered many core processors, in which resource management needs to determine application to cluster mappings. Parallel applications on one cluster may compete for shared resources such as the last little cache LLC, which leads to slowing down their executions. In this example, we show two clusters. The first one executes the application X264 with four threads, while the second one executes the application body track with also four threads. Comparing the two applications, we can see that X264 has higher LLC accesses. It is more memory intensive application than body track, while body track has higher power consumption compared to X264. Now, when a new application, namely Korski, arrives to the system, resource management needs to decide to which cluster to map this application. If it is mapped to cluster 1 with X264, it finishes its execution after 95 milliseconds and leads to a peak temperature of 72 degrees Celsius. While mapping it to cluster 2 with body track, leads to a lower response time of 83 milliseconds, which indicates lower cache contention, but it leads to a higher peak temperature, which is 81 degrees Celsius. That means there is a trade-off between cache contention and temperature, and resource management needs to consider it. To this end, we need to predict the impact of cache contention on clusters on the performance of co-running applications. To achieve this prediction, we propose a neural network model to predict the slowdown in the application execution in code on a cluster. The model is used to evaluate the impact of potential application to cluster mapping decisions. Then, we propose a thermal and contention-aware resource management technique called TCRM that uses predictions from the neural network model and jointly determines application to cluster mapping, threat to core mapping, and VF levels. The goal of TCRM is to minimize temperature while satisfying performance constraints of all applications 
considering the slowdown induced by cash contention. Here is an overview of the main steps in TCRM. At design time, we run simulations and obtain traces. Then we generate training and test data. Then we train the neural network for slowdown prediction. At runtime, this model will be called to evaluate the impact of application to cluster mappings. Then our TCRM will use these predictions to select the best application to cluster mapping. In addition, it selects the threat to core mapping and also the VF levels of the clusters. We evaluate our smart application mapping on the state-of-the-art many-core simulator that is called HUD Sniper. The simulated processor consists of eight clusters with eight cores for each. There are 256 kilobytes of a private L2 cache per core and eight megabytes shared last level cache per cluster. The frequency ranges from one to four gigahertz and we compare TCRM with CoRM, which is a combination of two state-of-the-art techniques. One considers thermal aware mapping while the other one considers cache aware mapping. The experiments have been conducted on a workload consisting of 20 randomly selected applications from two benchmark suites. We conducted five experiments, each of them with different arrival rates of applications to test different system utilizations. Performance constraints of applications are inputs to our TCRM, and it is assumed that the constraints will be met at 2.4 gigahertz. Here are the main evaluation results of TCRM, evaluated in terms of response time of applications, which is shown in the upper figure, and the chip temperature shown in the lower figure. In both figures, we show the results for the five experiments corresponding to the five arrival rates. In the upper figure, for each experiment, we show the distribution of the resulting response times of all running applications in the workload normalized to their corresponding performance constraints. We can see that TCRM satisfies all performance constraints with minimal slack time, while CoRM has long slack time up to 31%. In the lower figure, we report the distribution of the maximum chip temperature at the score on the chip throughout the execution time of the experiments. We see that TCRM manages to significantly reduce temperature compared to the state of the art. These results can be explained by the selected frequencies. As we can see, CoRM selects higher frequencies which lead to higher temperatures and longer slack times. As a summary, TCRM manages to exploit new opportunities for performance and temperature optimizations. Let us now present the smart posting technique, which follows the second approach. That means it uses machine learning to predict hidden properties. In particular, different applications have different power and performance sensitivities to VF level changes. In this example, we have two applications executing at the same frequency 2 GHz. We want to boost the performance. To this end, we increase the VF level of Radix to 3 GHz and throttle LUCON to 1.9 GHz to maintain the same peak temperature. This selection of VF levels results in significantly higher performance at the same peak temperature. The reason is that Radix has high performance sensitivity to VF level change, and therefore it gets significant performance change when frequency is increased. At the same time, LUCONT has high power sensitivity to VF level changes, therefore downscaling it by only 0.1 GHz was sufficient 
to maintain the same peak temperature, also the pH levels of radix has increased by 1 gigahertz. This example motivates the need to predict at runtime power and performance sensitivities of applications on VF level changes in order to optimize for performance. Therefore, we propose an NM model to predict application sensitivities of performance and power SPERF and SPAR on VF level changes. This will be used at runtime. Also, we calculate a metric called STEM to indicate the temperature increase on a specific core for any given power increase. This can be estimated at design time. This model will be used by a boosting technique called Smart Boost to select the VF levels while jointly considering performance, power and temperature, and the goal of Smart Boost is to maximize performance under temperature constraint. Let us provide some more details. We use one model to predict both performance and power sensitivities as they are related. This exploits correlations to reduce overhead. We create training data by comparing slices of the same application at different VF levels. After estimating sensitivities and calculating a stamp, we put them together in one metric called boostability, which indicates performance change relative to hotspot temperature change. Then our technique boosts applications with high boostability and throttle applications with low boostability. Here is the overview of our smart boost. It depends on performance counters to estimate boostability by an NN model. Then this metric is used in the boosting decisions. These decisions include throttling some applications to avoid thermal violations. Some applications will be boosted to exploit thermal headroom, while some applications can be throttled to boost other applications, which lead to higher performance. Our technique has been evaluated on 8x8 cross -8 homogeneous processor running 20 applications. Five different arrival rates have been tested. In all experiments, our Smart Boost has higher performance than both the state-of-the-art technique and the state-of-the-practice technique Intel Turbo Boost. The neural network model used in our Smart Boost leads to higher accuracy compared to the state-of-the-art models. In summary, Smart Boost was able to maximize performance under temperature constraints. Let us now present our Smart Task migration. It follows the third approach, which means machine learning is employed to directly select resource management decisions. In smartphones, generated temperature adversely affects user experience and also low performance reduce user experience. Therefore, it is relevant in such devices to minimize temperature under user-defined quality of service target. This optimization can be done with application migration and DVFS. Here we have an example of a heterogeneous multi-core processor with ARM Big Little architecture, which has two clusters, little with small cores and big with big and more powerful ones. If we execute application sidle on little cluster, we should set the frequency to 1.2 GHz to satisfy its quality of service. Migrating it to big cluster allows executing it at lower frequency, 1 GHz. We notice also that executing it on the little cluster reduces temperature.
If we do the same experiment for the second application, ASI, we see that executing it on little cluster requires a frequency of 1.8 GHz to satisfy its quality of service. However, it can satisfy it at 0.7 GHz on the big cluster. Also, executing it on the big cluster reduces temperature, in contrast to the first application cycle. Another experiment for the application ADI has been conducted. When it runs in parallel with some background applications, executing it on the little cluster will be better in terms of temperature. As a result, achieving thermal optimization under quality of service targets is challenging due to the following facts. The characteristics of all applications need to be considered. Per cluster DVFS requires global optimization, limited access to measurements. There are no power sensors in this platform. We tackled these challenges by introducing Top IL, which is thermal aware optimization based on imitation learning. A neural network model is trained at design time to select the best application to call mapping based on relevant performance counters on the course. Then we accelerate the inference of the neural network model using the existing MPU on the smartphone chip. Our top IL has been evaluated on smartphone chip high keyboard showed that top IL is able to minimize temperature under quality of servers targets. Now I will conclude this tutorial with three messages. First of all, technology advancement enables further performance improvements by introducing many cores on single processor. Recent platforms and applications are complex, and to manage them, smart resource management is required. Finally, smart resource management techniques that use powerful machine learning algorithms enable exploiting full optimization potentials on recent complex platforms. Now, I would like to thank my colleagues, Dr. Martin Rapp, and Mohamed Bakr Sikhal for their support in preparing this tutorial. They are working with me and with Professor Hinkel in the research group of machine learning based resource management. For further information about our work, you can visit the webpage of our institute and our YouTube channel. Thank you for your attention.
రికార్డ్ స్టాప్ చేయాలా ఇంకా స్టాప్ పడితే సరిపోతుంది చేసిన సేవ అయిపోతుంది కదా